But yeah, UFOs do mimic. I mean, there's Richard Boylan, who's a researcher. He swears up and down. He was driving through New Mexico, and there was this car pacing him on a road paralleling his. And he says it's getting closer, and they're closer, and they're going to cross. And then he found out there's no road there. <laughs> this thing came close. It passed by him. It was a UFO. But he says it looked like a car. It took on the appearance of a vehicle. Welcome back. I'm here again with Preston Dennett. Preston, welcome back. <laughs> Thanks, Sean. All right, so today we're going to talk a little bit about mimicry and the phenomena. And Preston's going to, I think, go through some cases about UFOs mimicking various either aircraft or other things, right? It doesn't have to just be aircraft. And kind of understanding why that might be or or speculating at least on why that may be or what contactees might actually be saying about those sorts of things. So welcome back, Preston. Can you tell us a little bit about the history of this kind of mimicry? And yeah, you know? I mean, this is a difficult topic to discuss because, you know, people do have a tendency to overlay their own belief systems onto what they're looking at. And when someone sees a UFO, they go through what J. Allen Hynek called theory escalation. Mm -hmm. and I've certainly experienced this myself when I've seen unexplained lights and objects in the sky. You don't immediately jump to UFO. You, you think, well, what the heck is that? Is that a satellite? Is that, you know, what could this be? You go through various theories and you start eliminating them. And if we all have our own belief system about what we know to be true and what we believe is not true, <laughs> And so when someone has zero history with UFO encounters and never even considered it, they absolutely go through this process of this object trying to fit into their worldview. Right, trying so this, to rationalize what right. they're seeing, basically. So this is a huge factor, particularly in the UFO field. And just speaking of, you know, when people see entities, Yes, there's a whole history of what we call screen memories, where people see all different types of beings, and perhaps their own mind is overlaying some of this, but perhaps it's the ETs themselves projecting a different image. And we do see this with UFOs. And probably the most common that I've heard is these objects quite high up in the sky mimicking stars. And people are seeing what they think are stars, and they're looking at it, or a very bright planet. And if you're not astronomically <laughs> inclined, you don't know, you know, could this be Mars? Could this be Jupiter or Saturn or, you know, Venus, certainly, is the most common culprit. So people will be looking at these objects and thinking, well, gosh, you know, is that a star or not? And then it'll drop down and not a star. <laughs> When you see right. that, <laughs> and then it goes back up. I mean, I interviewed a gentleman in Ohio who would go outside and be like, there they are. You, and everyone's like, those are stars. He's like, no, they're not. <laughs> you just wait. And then, boom, they'd come down. And he had a real close connection to them. So he had this almost ability to call them down in a weird way, or at least know when they're coming. But one case along those lines comes to mind where a gentleman was driving through New Mexico. This isn't my case where I personally researched, but I read it. But I think it's a good case, well-researched, where this gentleman is driving along and these UFOs are chasing him down the highway. He's out of his mind with this because there's a tendency for UFOs to do this when you're driving on a remote highway late at night. There are literally a thousand cases like this where people are driving on the highway and UFOs are pacing them. And that's what's happening to him. And he's racing up to the next town, pulls into a gas station. And as soon as he does, this object goes zoop, straight up and he can still see it. It's the star-like object. And he races and he pulls people out like, look, you know, this thing chased me. And like, that's a star. It's like, it's not. Keep watching. And it stayed there. And he's reluctant to keep driving, but does. And as soon as he 
pulls back on the highway and he's away from civilization this darn thing comes right down and does it again and this happened twice <laughs> he went to the next town tried to show people but it went right up and mimicked a star when the united states and china clash the world will never be the same especially when forces beyond reality threaten to intervene what if the united states went to war with the people's republic of china how would these rivals fight for supremacy on land sea air and across the stochastic streams of time what wonder weapons would be unleashed what horrors would emerge from the irradiated sludge of the south china sea what heroes would rise and forever change the course of history tread into the deepest and darkest dimensions of the multiverse gaze through a kaleidoscope of fractured realities and bear witness to the disturbing visions of world war three from today's greatest minds in science fiction fantasy and horror Weird World War, China. Available now from Bain Books at Bain.com. And there's a lot of cases like this. There was an army officer who, you know, was working with, uh, what do you call those? Oh, gosh. I forget the name of them. It's a telescope connected to a protractor. It's where you can basically triangulate an object. I forget the name of it, but it's a way, weather observers use them all the time and military personnel to track aircraft gosh i can't believe i forget the name whatever the name of it is it's a t basically a telescope at attached to a measuring device a protractor type deal and it allows you to measure an aircraft's trajectory and with a couple of them you can triangulate out and determine how high up an object is and this guy is looking at these objects and he's like, gosh, those don't look like stars. <laughs> and as soon as he had one in its viewpoint, it started moving around like this. And there's a phenomena called autokinesis, where if mm -hmm. you stare at a star, it will appear to move. It'll start to move. Yeah, it'll yeah. start to move. And he thought, could this possibly be what's going on here until someone else like, did you see that? look, that star just moved. And he's like, yes, I did. And it was. This was not autokinesis. These were objects who were way the heck up there mimicking stars. So, so that is probably the most common. There's quite a few reports in the literature like that. And so there's a researcher, she's a scientist, PhD from some European university. And Part of her research is she looks at old pictures of the sky prior to the launch of Sputnik. And there are certain areas of the sky where in the picture there are stars, but when you compare it to a modern photo, they're not there anymore. That's odd. Yeah, and then she goes through systematically trying to find a pedestrian reason right to the point where you're looking at when the film was developed were there any impurities in the, the solution or, you know like all sorts of stuff like that comparing other photos that of other things using the same and she cannot looking at whether or not any of those stars supernova back in the past and you know if there's evidence of that and going through every pedestrian explanation can never find anything that points to like a normal explanation of what those things could be. So she doesn't say that they're UFOs, but she can't rule it out. Oh, that's yeah, that's there's some very interesting things with astronomy because very early on when astronomy was a young science. There was a number of people reporting a planet closer to the sun than Mercury. <laughs> Vulcan, I think they called it. And then one day there's just no more reports of it. And to this day, there's controversy over that, <laughs> whether there was an additional planet closer to the sun than Mercury. To advertise on Through Glass Darkly, email throughglassdarkly ads at gmail.com. Which 
I don't know, but that popped up in a number of UFO books. I don't know. I just thought of that when you mentioned that. <laughs> yeah. So just to add to your point about mimicry and stars, right? As long as you're hovering in a fixed position, you're not like bobbing up and down like you're on water. If there's a way to stabilize it, nobody would have a clue if they and There's were. a number of cases, you know, involving daylight sightings where people are seeing an object in the sky and the darn thing moves in front of the sun. So you cannot see it and then would move away. Now, that's not necessarily mimicry, but it's certainly an effective method of preventing you from seeing it. <laughs> what about clouds? and ufos yes that is a, a huge thing because there's case after case where there's an unusual cloud in the sky there's quite a few cases in southern california over the santa catalina channel of exactly that people seeing very unusual looking clouds kind of a lonely round cloud just sitting there mm -hmm. and alone fixed in the sky in a way where it's not morphing like clouds do because it's very rare for a cloud to just keep its same shape over a period of time. But there's case like after case of the Like lenticular clouds, basically. Yeah. And lenticular right. clouds, of course, are often pointed to for you know being blamed for UFO reports that are not UFOs. Right. And, you know, right. There's a lot like 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 Lake like Shat Mount Shasta has a lot of like like Mountainous areas have a, tend to have a lot of lenticular cloud, clouds, yeah. so you see that a lot over Mount Shasta, and that's just yeah. normal. And if you've ever seen a good lenticular cloud, it's impressive. And uh, you know, I took meteorology in college, and I'm so glad I did because that was good prep work for UFO research. And there's a lot of different clouds; you'd be surprised how scientific it gets. But yeah, lenticular cloud can be very convincing in terms of looking like something unnatural, but it's absolutely natural. And like you said, usually forms over a mountain and can be quite large. But there's case after case of these lonely little clouds going around it, and then the cloud dissipates and it's a darn UFO. So they can create a haze around them or mm -hmm. vapor. And that's not at all uncommon. Even at very low levels, treetop level, people will come upon a cloudy object and an, a UFO emerges from it. And I think in some cases, it's the electromagnetic fields or the high temperatures around it that is causing the water vapor to be distilled or what's the right word, evaporate around it. But sometimes it's clearly intentional because there's a huge number of cases where people are driving along and they hit a fog bank that they know this area well <laughs> you know there's usually not fog it's not that defined they drive into it and boom have their encounter and it, there's enough cases where i think it's safe to conclude that there's probably artificial or generated aspect to this like these are not normal fog banks by any means because there's too many cases where this happens, where someone drives up into a car. I know I have several myself. This gentleman was driving through New Mexico and looking ahead of him, saw this fog bank roiling and rolling towards him. And he said it was so thick. His first thought was that this was a landslide, but it couldn't possibly be because it stretched hundreds of feet in the sky and was across the entire width of the road and beyond. And it was coming towards him. He's like, well, this is really unusual. <laughs> what is this? You can see this in Close Encounters. They did a, a very much a representation of that in one of the when the UFO is coming to pick up the little boy. <laughs> and M Melinda Dillon, I think, was the actress. And you can see the roiling clouds coming in. That sort of thing does happen. And there's a lot of cases of UFOs going into clouds and hiding, coming out or even mimicking a cloud. And I talked to Dolly Saffron about this before the interview. Dolly Saffron, of course, being contactee, mm -hmm. subject of my book, Symmetry. She's had a lot of experiences. And she's talked about this quite extensively in the book itself and on interviews that we do together. And she says, you can look upon a UFO in a way as an analogy they are like cuttlefish. 
and have the ability to change their appearance that they have what we would think of as light cells on the surface of their craft right which enable them to appear as a cloud if they want right right and i was going over examples with her and she's like well you know we can land and look like a boulder and that immediately struck a chord with me because i thought of the rua zimbabwe case 1994 in Zimbabwe at Ariel Elementary School, where some 200 kids were on the playground and UFOs landed. A number of students said that they thought at first this thing was a boulder <laughs> sitting next to the school that wasn't there before. And I, and I kind of just kind of skipped over that, for, you know, reading it until, you know, I connected the dots and like, wow, yeah, they do have the ability to mimic things and you know i talked to dolly at length about this just today she said yeah they can go in front of trees or a horizon or a cliff and very much like an invisibility cloak or whatever take on the appearance of the landscape around them or for that matter appear as anything anything at all it can be a blimp or in dolly's case at age five i believe it was she had a ufo coming down to pick her up she had just seen mary poppins the movie she could have sworn it was mary poppins coming down on an umbrella <laughs> of course it wasn't but they put that appearance out and this is something they're physically doing this is not you know hypnosis they can well, do this this is probably nothing but i'm going to share it anyways since it might be relevant because there's no way of me knowing so this is a picture that I took using a GoPro. So I just pulled it out of my GoPro. This is Stanford University. This is the Oval. And this is the day of the Soul Foundation conference. And right. the building that the Soul Foundation was in was somewhere off in this area. But you have this, you know, these, again, it's probably just clouds, right? But you have these kind of, particularly these two, they're just an oddly different shape from the rest of them. Probably nothing, but, you know, who knows, right? Again, the classic lenticular clouds in an area where it's not, there are lots of rolling hills, but not really anything you would call a large mountain. Yeah, I mean, hard to say. I can't tell you how often I get hundred percent right. I get photographs. Like I, I wouldn't people. report this as a, I wouldn't report this as a sighting. I'm just no. I'm just I, I wouldn't either. It's, you know what we have is this phenomenon called pareidolia. Yep. Where you see you is, see what you want to see, right? Yeah, you're, you're, you can see the Virgin Mary on a tree trunk, and I'm not kidding. That's a thing. <laughs> and, oh yeah, or Jesus but, on your toast, right? Yeah, faces in rocks and clouds are. Per particularly susceptible to pareidolia because our brains are hardwired to see patterns and faces especially up here all over the place yep and i remember every time i drove down my home street cheney drive in spanga canyon there was a tree stump that would fool me almost every time i finally like got used to it after years but it looks like a person it was so annoying because you know that how many times did you drive by and you think, oh my gosh, it's a person. No, it's not. But it had that shape. And it's mm -hmm. really hard to shake that. And when someone sees something very briefly, and that's often true for UFO sightings, your mind overlays. Because I would see this tree stump and I would see, you know, person, clothes, fate. I mean, the whole, we don't necessarily see accurately. Our brain fills out the details right. that we are not seeing. Right, because if we saw accurately, our brains wouldn't be able to process all the information that was coming in all at once. Yeah, right? and you can get a sense of this if you leave your hometown on vacation for two or three weeks and pull up to your street for the first time after not seeing it. And you're like, gosh, everything. I didn't remember it being this long or, you know, that tree, look at that. You know, you start to look at it with new eyes. It's like when you're a kid and everything looks fresh and new and you're like, oh, my God. But as we see the same tree over and over and over again, we stop looking at it because we already know what it looks like. We can look at it and we fill it in. You can see this when you're doing writing and doing proofreading. You think you know what you wrote. And you pass over every darn 
typo in there. I learned this. I have to now use a reader to read it out because I do not see the typos. Your brain slides right yeah. over them. I mean, this is just from a viewpoint of someone who's done a lot of writing. <laughs> but no, it, no, I it, so it, when I ed, I write and edit, and what I typically do is I'll do one pass with the edit and try to make sure it sounds good. And then I will turn my computer on and have my computer read me exactly. the story. <laughs> That's what because I do. Because if I read it myself, right, out loud, I'll skip over because as you said, you're mind will fill in the word that's missing it's typically good for missing words that's where i miss yeah make the most what we do with reality we are doing this with reality as we perceive it and this is the problem but yeah ufos do mimic i mean there's richard boylan who's a researcher he swears up and down he was driving through new mexico and there was this car pacing him on a road paralleling his and he says it's getting closer and they're closer and they're going to cross and then he found out there's no road there <laughs> this thing came close it passed by him it was a ufo but he says it looked like a car it took on the appearance of a vehicle now is this paradelia you know is this an object that's actually mimicking a car he thinks so that was his interpretation so well, even even with witness statements, people will swear that they saw a black Bronco and it turned out it was a Ford 150 truck in a crime, but they will swear under oath that, no, that's not what I saw. This is what I saw. So people make simple misperception errors all the time. And once you lock that in, you do remember it that way. Mm -hmm. And there's, you know, this kind of speaks towards the Mand Mandela effect. You know, there's certain like oh, yeah. people like the Monopoly card of the jail out free. I mean, there's or little details. People were sure it was this way. And that's how they perceived it. And that came locked in. And like you say, this happens all the time with eyewitness testimony of a person who committed a crime, say, and like, well, he had a beard. But well, once they've locked that in, even if he did or didn't, they can see it in their head. So this is a problem with memory really i think more than anything because once you it's remember a certain it. way that's how you perceive it but if i get one more person sending me pictures of clouds saying do you see that <laughs> and you know when it's all over the internet people seeing stuff and if you have to circle it to to point out the anomaly it's probably not an anomaly <laughs> it should be obvious i hate to say that because of course it could be anything i mean it right. could really be a ufo up there Right, it's very high probability that it's just a cloud. But clouds are a real problem in terms of people's perception. Mm -hmm. But a number of cases where people have seen what they thought was a conventional aircraft, but turned out not to be. There was one guy I interviewed who says he had a helicopter hovering over him, and it started speaking at him in a loudspeaker, and then speaking to him telepathically, and then transformed into a UFO. And it was the ETs who basically were announcing that they're going to come and pick him up. And he doesn't like UFOs. He mm. is very religious. He does think they're demonic. He was, I think, what we call my lab. He was a military mm -hmm. officer who was hypnotized. I mean, they made no bones about it. They hypnotized him and used lights and drugs and the whole deal. He said, I, I was the victim of some weird experiment with these guys at Camp Pendleton in Southern California, mm -hmm. and but a genuine contactee as well. So I wonder about his perception of this particular event. And was this the military pulling a fast one on him? And I lean towards that explanation because it's an outlier. I don't have other cases like it. But now okay, with I don't know. I don't know. Now, with these memories, and we talked about this, we touched on it briefly in, I think, many prior interviews, but I'm still curious what your perspective is. With memory as shaky as it is, a hypnosis, hypnotic regression, I guess is what I was looking for. Does that 
help reinforce and cement these false memories or can that unlock what truly happened or just give a better sense of what happened and then can it also if it's done properly i understand if it's done improperly where people are suggesting things to you it, it can create false memories yeah it sure can yeah we know this there's been a lot of studies of people who've gone under hypnosis for mundane events and ver verify that it was absolutely false recall but many additional studies which show 100 percent that they recalled correctly because you can prove it so you have both sides of the coin here and what you said needs to be underlined if done correctly mm -hmm. but i can tell you having talked to a lot of people who've had missing time and gone under hypnosis some absolutely 100 percent think that their memories are valid and have reasons to believe that because there are multiple witness cases where people had had missing time together and were taken on board in fact in my latest book humanoids and high strangeness a gentleman had missing time with well yeah he at age seven suddenly became an insomniac could not sleep fear of intruders the whole deal and lived with this until age 21 when his mother Ina is her name his name is Richard Richard Simon he let me use his real name and he his mother said I'm going to a hypnotist <laughs> to quit smoking I've tried to quit smoking I can't do it this lady's good at her job she's got a resume you should come with me and she'll work on your insomnia He's like, no, I'm not doing that. I don't trust hypnosis. She's like, listen, this is a medical doctor. She knows what she's doing. So he relented and said, okay, fine. They go together. She's first, goes in, and he's waiting in the waiting room and starts hearing her screaming and crying. He's like, what is going on with my mom? You know, this is not how people quit smoking. Something is wrong. And she comes out all teary-eyed after an hour. And he's like, well, mom, what happened? She says, you know what? Just go into your appointment. I'll talk about it afterwards. And so he does, and he tells the doctor, Retha was her name. What happened? What did you do with my mom? Why is she so upset? And she's like, I'll talk about it after your session. You know, you're here to overcome your insomnia. Let's talk about that. And he's like, okay, fine. And she couldn't find any reason. You know, he had a good family life and so forth. And finally puts him under hypnosis took 20 minutes it's a long process and asked him what happened at age seven that caused you not to be able to sleep and he instantly saw lights and the grays peering down at him the dam broke she didn't have to say a darn word other than what happened and he remembered being pulled on board a craft being physically examined grays a very typical encounter and then being put back and finally he remembered the beginning of the incident which was the most traumatic that was the last thing he recalled and he leaps off the couch fully awake now broken out of hypnosis and attacks not physically but verbally attacks hypnotists saying you planted this in my head how dare you you have no ethics this is all made up she says stop stop right there here's the tape you can have it mm. you will see i didn't say one word and she didn't he remembered this all on his Ooh. own were you able to exa examine the tape no no not yet mm -hmm. i'm still in touch with him um mm -hmm. he's very cooperative i have not examined it yet but he's sending me stuff but at any rate that's what he recalled and he apologized like you're right you know i'm sorry you didn't say anything this is just did, a lot did he to deal even with suspect prior to going into hypnosis that he had any contact whatsoever no even though he did have a missing time incident just before going to the hypnotist but didn't you know it wasn't something that was part of his worldview he just didn't think about it and so he talks to his mom he's like you're not gonna she says you remembered right and he's like yeah I do remember and you were there and she's like yeah and you were there they remember they, they both oh so they corroborated the their stories yes she was in the other room she's like if you hurt my son I will bleep 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 rip your bleep bleep I mean she cursed them out <laughs> And he remembered her screaming her head off and he's like thank god you know she's going to rescue me 
so it was traumatic for him to the point where you know he completely suppressed it and so did she apparently but they both were able to corroborate each other's story and that's a good example of how hypnosis can be 100 percent accurate because there's just no way it, if it's done correctly right yeah. if people aren't saying like what color were the aliens right like, right and neither of them went in there you know thinking that this is what's going to come out <laughs> and certainly neither did the hypnotist and it was so interesting because she said you know i had an experience at age seven <laughs> that's when mine started and he grew up got married had a seven-year-old daughter who came r running up to the tv and pointed at it at age seven said daddy he's watching the history channel the grays are being portrayed so like, daddy that's what's coming into my room and poking me in the nose and giving me these nosebleeds well she grew up and this is just recently she has a, a well now the daughter is like 10 or, or so but at age seven her daughter says mommy there's this bald monkey man standing outside my window i'm coming to my room at night that's four generations of people who've had experiences at, at age seven do starting these generational experiences do the children have a tendency to wander outside yeah Things they will that. find them outside in the middle of the night doors are locked they can't get inside that's that happened that happened to my youngest son like he when i was gone i wasn't around but he was pounding on the outside door at like 4 a.m because he couldn't get back in now he could have wandered outside right yeah there's no other reason to. but every one of my children has an incident like that where they wander outside leave the house and then you know freak my wife out because i'm never around when it happens it tends to happen when i'm not home it's kind of weird i wouldn't read anything into it unless you take the questionnaire and start ticking all the other boxes of close-up ufo sightings little balls of light in the house strange marks nope. you know nope. healings fear of intruders a real strong emotional reaction to images of ufos or the subject itself whether it's a repulsion or an attraction i mean there's a whole list of questions insomnia all of these things um, yeah but um, yeah it's certainly on the list dreams of ufos and ets there's about 100 questions that you know i think once you reach the 70 80 percentile then probably you fit the profile is there, is there a link to these questions like is this something that's public or well, is it there's a few researchers, Melinda Leslie, Edith Fiore. If you just type it on the internet, UFO questionnaire, it'll take you to various ones. Some I would take with a little bit of a grain of salt because some of the questions are a little outlandish. But it's a good starting point, certainly, because there's a number of them. And I have my own list of questions that I ask people, which are kind of adapted from my own years of research and from other people. Yeah, but you don't publicly give them out for good reason, I'm assuming, right? Because right. that helps you suss out if somebody's a fraud or if they mention like an odd detail that is not discussed publicly anywhere so that they couldn't yeah, have possibly which is almost known. impossible now because the subject right. is now right. mainstream. Right. But certainly right. over the you know, 10 years ago, even it's pretty darn easy because there's details that people just don't know about and there's a few which i'm kind of holding close but absolutely it's pretty easy to say what the inside of a craft looks like <laughs> but if you interview someone and you go through all the details of how did they take you what did the ets look like how were they dressed what did they say to you what tools did they have you know you go through the whole experience detail by detail and it fits a very set pattern. Mm -hmm. I think that UFO researchers know quite well, but the average person would not, unless they are very well studied on the subject. All right, now getting back on topic in terms of mimicry, what about biomimicry? We talked a little bit about in the last episode, owls and things like that, but are there any other instances of biomimicry with UFOs? Yeah. yeah, birds, certainly. And I asked Dolly about that. She's like, well, you know, I was in the craft one time and we pretended to be a balloon of a whale. <laughs> but you're kidding. 
You should, no, no, you know, they, they can do that. They can take on the appearance of anything, of just the sky itself. Mm -hmm. So basically, it's much like Wonder Woman's invisible airplane <laughs> flying right. through the sky. You wouldn't see it. And I think that probably takes place most often. But that, she's and asked her about this. She says, yeah, sometimes they will do this, particularly with younger people, to impress them, not so much as a disguise or a technique to throw someone off, but rather to impress them in some way, in a way that will remove the fear of seeing something that's completely out of their worldview. But there's weird aspects to this. I did interview a young gentleman. I generally don't like to interview children because without their parents present, certainly. But this guy was yeah, because you could be accused of suggestion and all that stuff. And all right. You this be. guy was an older teenager. I think he was seventeen. I'm like, okay, just tell me what happened. You know, because he contacted me, and I'm like, okay, you know, tell me what happened. And he says, well, I was with a group of my friends. We were all there, and I saw a UFO. I'm like, okay, what did it look like? He says it was a classic saucer, a silver craft. It wasn't far away. It was maybe four or five hundred feet, right above the trees there. And I'm like, look, look. And all, all his friends looked at him like, what are you talking about? He said, right there. Don't you see it? Like, we don't see anything. They're standing right next to him. He could see it. And he's like, well, look. And, and he held them up and, you know, put his, their, look, it's right there. And, and could not see it. They could not see it. And having talked to contactees who've asked about this, and there's a number of them, the ETs told them, I mean, I talked to a Navy medic. Who asked about this because he was the only one on his ship who was looking at a massive ufo and no one else could see it and he was taken on board and he asked him about it he said well we can control who sees us and if we don't want you to see us you won't and this explains a lot of cases i interviewed people about a massive wave over my hometown of topanga canyon 1992 to 94 eight thousand residents on June 14th, 1992, people were calling the police, the newspaper's office. I drove through the canyon that night. I didn't see a darn thing. But talking to these other people, I'm like, I should have seen something. <laughs> I didn't. So they can kind of pick and choose, and you can have a crowd of people. And I've got cases of this at like a ball game. I think it was a ball game. This wasn't my personal case. But some people could see it. Others could not see it. So there is something going on there that we don't fully understand, but the ETs say they can do this. And I do think we're dealing with ETs, by the way. I know everyone's got their own theory about this, but I think that's the best explanation that fits the evidence. It's almost inescapable given that we are biological beings living on a planet. I think we can say that with a fair amount of certainty that we are beings on a planet. Mm -hmm. And it's almost inescapable logic that other people are out there and the fact that we are seeing craft with people inside them and leaving burn marks and people being pulled on board and, i mean if you look at the totality of the evidence i don't know if you've seen this floating around but there's a guy i'm not going to mention his name out of i don't think he wants his name mentioned but he had this using ai he had this book it was either a soviet book or a book written in german about soviet ufo incidents and he had it translated and there's some really interesting anecdotes or incidents in that particular book a lot of it is based on this high strangeness with time so if you go in with like a mechanical watch into some of these places where there's been where they've measured uh, landing traces and things like that time passes differently or the, at least your watch sh seems to either slow down or speed up i'd have to check but it persists it's not like you know it's just there for a few hours afterwards like it persists for a while i'm not sure if it's a few days a few weeks or That's even months now well, there's a, a couple of accounts of people who reportedly went into you know worked with crashed ufos you know the whole ufo retrieval subject go inside and 
and come out and they remember spending you know a good 15 20 minutes in there and they come out and over an hour has passed and their watch verifies that or they see a craft that's 30 this was from leonard stringfield a 30 foot wide craft the guy was supposed to photograph it which he did and went inside and he said this darn thing was bigger than a baseball field which well yeah did. i mean if you, if you imagine if you imagine some form of propulsion works by warping space time you're going to warp space and you're going to warp time right yeah. I mean, so, the high strangeness is off the charts i talked to one guy he says i'm so glad you did this article on that sort of thing because every time i have an encounter i come back i am a couple of inches different in height <laughs> like you're kidding me he's like no i'm not i'm telling you my height varies from six foot to one inch to down to five foot eight i didn't do a formal interview with him it was just a very brief phone call because he was just looking to thank me for putting out research that was along those lines because i do have a couple of cases where you know, betty andreason talked about this she mm -hmm. saw the ets shrink down a guy into a two-foot little thing and put him in a little ufo and off he went and when i asked dolly saffron about that she's like well yeah i did see that happen <laughs> on the craft once this guy came in and they took him into a room and shrunk him down and walked him off she asked about it and they said well there's a macro universe and there's a micro universe and really wouldn't elaborate on it but these are the sort of high strangeness incidents that a lot of researchers and i forgive them for not going there yeah uh, there's but, just too much to to compile and to handle and to process yeah, and it's and, fascinating stuff and i think yeah. this is what leads some researchers to sort of reject the et explanation which I think is a mistake because you can say you believe this or that and you can speculate all you want, but you really have to take a look at all the evidence. And Jacques Vallée, of course, is very well known for saying that he doesn't think this is necessarily ET, while at the same time, just wrote a book, The Tr Trinity, about a crash retrieval. I'm like, well, hold on a second. If there's a vehicle, are you telling me that that is not a vehicle? And that this is a psychological materialization of an intelligence that's pretending to be a craft? Yeah, I'd really I like to pin him down on that. My personal view trends toward the like Buck Rogers universe, or not even Buck Rogers. I think there's all sorts of things in the universe that we don't understand, yeah. and life living on other worlds, I think, is table stakes. Right. I mean, like, look at Mars, for goodness sake. They have a methane cycle, right? In the winter, it kind of goes away. And then in the summer and fall, you know, when it's close to the sun, it starts producing methane, right? Now, I'm sure some NASA scientist egghead will come up with why that happens and things like that. But it also, methane cycles tend to be correlated with life, right? Signs of life. They've tried to explain away the faces on Sidonia Mensis and Galaxis Chaos and all that stuff. And, you know, maybe they're right. Maybe they're not, right? Maybe there was an ancient civilization there. But anyway, there's just the evidence out there is so overwhelming. And take John Keel. I know John, John Keel would stray away from kind of the ET hypothesis. And that's not why I'm quoting him. What's interesting about John Keel, as I'm reading Operation Trojan Horse right now, and in that book, he looks at local kind of state and local newspapers and examines reports. And he just reports them as they stand. And what he found in that book, or at least the part of it that I'm reading right now, is that in terms of coverage, you get highly detailed local news reports, including some of the high strangeness. But when it is aggregated up to the national level, there's a distinct, like a great silence throughout that whole period, right? It's almost as if none of those reports is filtering upward to national news and media reports, which fits in with the whole CIA's Operation Mockingbird and things like that, where they can kill stories. You know, he had a newspaper clipping service where he was getting hundreds of reports a day, 
about this stuff, but it was never in national newspapers. I certainly found that to be true. And that's why I think you know, when I wrote Schoolyard UFO Encounters, it was a huge shock to me. I, although I'd been in this field for 30 some years at that point, I had no idea that there was a hundred cases. Now it's closer to 200 of UFOs hovering over schoolyards at very low level during the day, landing in one third of the cases. It was almost exclusively reported in local newspapers. Didn't reach into a lot of books. In the drive-in theater, same thing. I wrote a book on drive-in theater encounters. I found one case in books. Almost all of it was from UFO reporting services or newspapers. Now, you know, with the internet, you have access to a lot of archives. So it's amazing to see that. <laughs> well, I know a guy who's working on an AI software program that is aggregating all these old clipping services and categorizing the reports and things like the AI is just kind of putting it together so you can easily search. So, you know, I had him do it for my area and he was able to, at the point of a button, aggregate all the reports in my town over time. And he's just like, yeah, your area... It's not like a Catalina crazy, but it's elevated, right? And which would make sense because where I live, they used to have bunkers. I, I mean, I, I think most of it was in the, like the 60s and 70s and things like that with these reports. But prior to the 80s, and it may have even lasted in part of the 80s, there were bunkers out here where they stored some nuclear weapons, which always t tend to generate hot spots for Same. ufos yeah. so anyway i think we're over time my friend but as always it's an absolute pleasure you're an absolute treasure when it comes to knowledge about this topic and it's always a blast to have you on preston so thank you hey it's an honor and a delight i appreciate it talk soon my friend for sure if you enjoyed today's video, please hit like and subscribe and also hit the notification button so you can be notified whenever I post new content. Thank you. Now, if you're enjoying the channel and you want to support it, there are several things you can do. In fact, there are five things you can do. The first thing you can do is just buy my books. I got plenty of books out in the market right now and I would prefer that folks buy a book rather than giving me direct support because they get something out of it. They have a real tangible product. The second way you can support me is by becoming a member on YouTube or becoming a patron on Patreon. And just go to either site and it'll explain everything. third way you can support the channel is by checking out my merch site, which is here. There's plenty of stuff that you could get to support the channel. And I'd appreciate that you, you have it and you can wear it. Not only do you help support the channel, but you also help promote the channel. And I appreciate that. The fourth way that you can support the channel, and this is really easy, is anytime you want to buy something on Amazon, literally just go to the description below and click on any link, literally any link. The channel gets a cut of that, and it costs you no extra money. You just go through the link as I'm part of the Amazon Affiliates Club. The fifth and final way you can support the channel is through donations. Now, I don't prefer these because it's more of an expression of gratitude, but you don't really get anything out of it as a subscriber to the channel. However, if you decide to do these options, there's two options. There's Buy Me A Coffee, which is a separate site, and there's also you can go through YouTube with either a Super Chat, Super Sticker, or a Super Thanks. Again, I prefer Buy Me A Coffee because that organization takes less money than Amazon does. But either way, I appreciate any support you, you are willing to give the channel. So thank you very much and keep watching. I really appreciate it.